This video will explain the first GPT model developed by OpenAI. GPT is a 12-layer, 12-attention 12 head transformer decoder that explores how to take advantage of massive unlabeled text datasets to fine-tune them on limited supervised learning datasets. Some of the interesting contributions of the GPT model are the input transformations for task-specific fine-tuning and keeping language modeling as a part of the fine-tuning loss function. They also explore pre-training on the books corpus dataset, which requires longer-range context modeling than the 1 billion word benchmark dataset. This video will also give a quick description of the 12 supervised learning tasks GPT is fine-tuned on, such as natural language inference, multiple choice style question answering, semantic similarity, and text classification. This video will explain the first GPT model presented in the paper Improving Language Understanding by Generative Pre-Training, developed by research scientists at OpenAI. GPT was developed to take advantage of semi-supervised learning in natural language processing. Semi-supervised learning describes the learning setting in which you have a massive unlabeled data set and a relatively smaller labeled data set. This is especially evident in natural language processing because you can get a ridiculously large text data set from the internet such as Wikipedia or doing things like the common crawl corpus, but labeling data for tasks like question answering or semantic similarity takes much longer and requires significant manual effort. In GPT, the authors pre-train the model with the books corpus dataset. This dataset contains 7,000 unpublished books from a variety of genres. What well, this is one of the most interesting details about the GPT paper is that they trade on this books corpus uh, language modeling task and previous language models frequently were looking at this 1 billion word benchmark. So this image taken from a recent blog post unveiling DeepMind's new PG-19 dataset gives a good illustration of how different datasets for this pre-training task uh, language modeling have different long-range context modeling requirements and this significantly impacts the pre-training performance when you then have the sequence model like a transformer or an LSTM because the 1 billion word uh, benchmark requires an average context to do the language modeling task of about 27 words. So the transformer isn't really practicing that long range modeling as much as it does on this book's corpus data set. This slide describes a fine tuning strategy used in the GPT model in order to go from the pre-training language modeling task to fine tuning on the different classification tasks and other tasks that are used to uh, evaluate the GPT model on downstream supervised learning tasks. So first you have this language modeling task which is where you have this uh, context of size k and you're iteratively predicting the next token in the sequence. So what this works is you take in the input as this uh, weight embedding of the uh, tokens plus the position embedding in the transformer. This uh, W sub P denotes the position embedding matrix and the W sub E denotes the uh, text, the token embedding matrix. So then you pass this uh, input into, uh, in the paper they use 12 transformer blocks and then you have the output is the softmax distribution over that original uh, embedding matrix for the tokens. Then in the supervised learning task, you're predicting the class label given the input sequence. So in this case, you have this, the final output after it goes through these uh, 12 transformer blocks is a softmax between the, uh, you know, this final representation and then the weight matrix, matrix for the uh, number of labels in the classification task. So one of the most interesting characteristics of GPT is the way that they uh, keep doing the language modeling, the pre-training task in the fine tuning on the classification problem. So they have this uh, lambda parameter that weights the loss as the uh, model is fine-tuned, it's also still doing text prediction as well as the new supervised learning task. One of the key contributions of the original GPT paper is the way that they do task-specific input transformations so that when they're doing the supervised learning task, it has a similar input representation as the pre-training uh, predict, predict the next token uh, language modeling task. So they introduce special tokens like a dollar sign for the delimiter between sentences and the entailment, similarity, and multiple choice question answering kind of task. And this is all done so that the input for these supervised learning tasks resembles the language modeling task input. And these inputs are also well suited to additionally continue the language modeling task as an auxiliary objective. You just uh, you know do the same kind of iterative masking as you predict the context and then predict the delimiter, then predict the first answer in this kind of a format. So it's interesting to look at and see the uh, input representations, exactly how they do this, such that you can have a smooth transition from the pre-training language modeling task into these different tasks of like text classification, entailment, uh, semantic similarity, and then the question answering task. In the GPT model, they use a transformer decoder. So the idea here is that we have these uh, attention over the inputs, and you don't do the same attention over the encoder. So in the transformer decoder, you just have this right half of the original transformer architecture, and you don't do this uh, encoding of the sequence into the, uh, you know, into the decoder. Rather, it's just this part of the transformer. These are some of the tasks that are tested by supervised learning with the original pre-training with the GPT transformer decoder model. So the first is uh, natural language inference. So the idea here is that you have this premise and then you have the hypothesis and you label how they relate to each other. 
to see something like, yes, now you know, if everybody, like in August, when everybody's on vacation or something, we can dress a little more casual or, and then the hypothesis is that August is a blackout month for vacations in the company. So it's a contradiction because uh, the two sentences don't really relate to each other. And the other is that at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, people began to line up for a White House tour. And then the hypothesis is that people formed a line at the end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And this is an entailment because the two are related. So it's an interesting task that requires this kind of a language understanding in order to uh, understand the relationship between the premise and the hypothesis. The next task tested is question answering, and they use the race data set, different from the Stanford question answering data set or the squad data set. So the way they format this is like a multiple choice uh, question answering. So it's different from how, say, the BERT model does question answering, how it traverses the passage and then labels the uh, answer within the passage. What this is doing is it's looking at these different uh, potential answers for the question, like the girl handed the letter back to the main mailman because and then these different uh, possible answers that each get passed separately as input representations to the transformer and they're aggregated in this final linear layer so all the representations that come out of each sequence from the transformer are then combined with these additional uh, linear classification layers the next task tested is semantic similarity a great example of this is the Quora data set question pairs seeing if the people are asking the same questions over and over again on Quora. so one example of similar questions are should i learn python or java first is asking the same thing semantically as if I had to choose between learning Java and Python, what should I choose to learn first? You see how this task requires this kind of a language understanding and it's difficult to just uh, parse it and do some kind of like term frequency, inverse document frequency, or some kind of just overlapping n-grams to tell if, the, you know, if they have the same semantic meaning in the question. The next task tested is text classification. So in this case, the GPT model takes in the sentence and then it labels it as being grammatically correct or incorrect. So in total, the GPT model is evaluated with supervised learning after doing the generative pre-training task on the book's corpus data set on these 12 different data sets that are broadly categorized on tasks of natural language inference, which is where you have the premise and the hypothesis and you're uh, labeling the relationship between them, question answering, which in this case is formatted as a multiple choice, uh, where you take in each of the different uh, potential answer sequences, and then you have this uh, extra modeling layer that is going to predict the uh, correct answer from the representations formed from each of the uh, potential answer sequences. Then you have sentence similarity like the core question pairs, which is where you look at two questions or two sentences and you tell if semantically they're saying the same thing or not. And then you have classification, things like uh, the uh, sentiment classification, like the Stanford sentiment tree bank. And then you have the, uh, is this grammatically correct or not classification task. These ablations show the impact of some of the different factors of variation presented in the GPT model. The first of which is the number of layers transferred with this transfer learning task as you go from pre-training on the language modeling on this 7,000 book books corpus data set into the different supervised learning tasks. So for example, when you uh, go from the pre-training task into something like the core question pairs uh, semantic similarity, you might decide to just keep the uh, six layers of the transformer decoder, the same parameters from the pre-training task, and then have randomly initialized weights for the uh, next six transformer decoder blocks. And this shows that the more of the layers that you keep, from the pre-training task, the better the model performs. So you see, you know, the more layers that you keep as you're fine-tuning this model in the supervised learning task, the better the overall accuracy and performance is. So similarly in uh, this plot, it's showing the effect of how many of these pre-training updates you do, uh, how that impacts the downstream performance. So you see, again, the more steps that you take with doing the pre-training on the, you know, books corpus predict the next token, the better the model will perform on tasks like uh, sentiment analysis, and uh, different other you know, tasks that the, of the 12 tasks that the GPT model is then fine-tuned for. This ablation shows the effects of different things like not doing the pre-training, which you see a massive decrease in performance, not using the auxiliary language model when you're doing the fine-tuning, in which case you see that the larger data sets like the core question pairs and the uh, NYU natural language inference data set, they seem to benefit more from doing the, uh, by doing the auxiliary language modeling task than when you have smaller data sets, which is an interesting thing. This auxiliary language modeling is describing when you're fine-tuning the model, you're still doing that uh, language model and predict the next token on the modified input sequence as done with that weighted lambda parameter. And the last one is comparing the difference between an LSTM, you know, same auxiliary language model setup, and the transformer. So you see that the transformer, uh, it has a, a bigger prediction over a long range compared to the LSTM that is more of a short range uh, context modeling. Thanks for watching this overview of the GPT model. I hope from this video you're able to take away how they use the uh, generative pre-training task on that books corpus data set, which is interesting because it requires a longer context modeling than the previous 1 billion word benchmark, and how they fine tune this on the supervised learning task by having this interesting modification of the input sequence such that it resembles the pre-training task. And it's also interesting to see how they uh, keep that auxiliary language modeling objective 
when they're doing the fine tuning. I hope also you thought it was interesting to go through the tasks that they test, these 12 different natural language processing tasks, and just to get a better sense of you know, what the GBT model is all about and what the key ideas in this paper are. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.